Hi, this is Scott Vaughn, and I'm here running the game Kerbal Space Program. I've got a rocket here orbiting the planet Kerbin at an altitude of 100 kilometers. Well, you can see the altitude here. It's about 100,432 meters, so roughly 100 kilometers. You can see my current orbital speed right here, 2245.4 meters per second. You can see the apoapsis and periapsis. The apoapsis is the distance when I, um, the, it's the furthest distance from the surface and the periapsis is the closest. Actually these are in reference to the surface of the planet um, and you can also see them here, apoapsis and periapsis. Very close, uh, very nearly equal and that's why this is a very nearly circular orbit. You can see the eccentricity is very close to zero also indicating that it is a nearly circular orbit. So in this video, we'll study the math of uniform circular motion as it applies to orbital mechanics and consider the relationship between work and potential and kinetic energy. This video is going to cover these topics sort of generally, but is motivated to answer some homework questions from the Calc 2 class. So I'll talk about these concepts of circular orbits and eventually answer the following questions. All right, the questions that I uh, intend to answer in this video are the following here and uh, it says at the top a ship with a mass m equal 3000 kilograms orbits above the atmosphere of the planet Kerbin assume the planet Kerbin has a mass of 5.29 times 10 to the 22 kilograms and a radius of 600 kilometers also the gravitational constant g is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 in newton meter squared per kilogram per kilogram squared so Question number three in the homework is compute the work done by gravity as the rocket maneuvers from a circular orbit at 100 kilometers to one at 150 kilometers above the surface of Kerbin. This is equivalent with a sign change to finding the change in the rocket's potential energy. We'll also look at number four, determine the velocity of the rocket at circular orbits of 100 and also 150 kilometers and calculate the change in kinetic energy between these orbits and how does this relate to the work done by gravity and change in potential energy as the rocket moves between these orbits. And finally, compute the escape velocity at an altitude of 150 kilometers above the surface of planet Kerbin. So maybe what I'll do now is just sort of back up and say, how did I get into orbit? And so it begins with, first of all, uh, the planet Kerbin has a radius of 600 kilometers. So this red circle represents the spherical planet Kerbin with a radius of 600 kilometers. And the atmosphere around Kerbin is about 70 kilometers thick. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm launching from a point on the surface and creating enough horizontal velocity and vertical velocity to move out of the atmosphere and up to an altitude where there isn't any more atmosphere that no longer uh, slows down the rocket and so if it has enough speed it's going to begin to just uh, continue to be pulled back to the planet by gravity but because of that incredible horizontal velocity it just begins to orbit around and around and around so that the only force acting out here is gravity. There's no more air resistance. And when gravity is turning it, but it's going fast enough horizontally, it'll just get into a, a stable circular orbit. Okay, I have no, another graph drawn in here where the first circle is for, with a radius of 600, that is 600 kilometers, and that's the radius of the planet Kerbin. So this red curve would be the planet, and then Outside of that, I've got another circle with a radius of 670, and that would account for the um, radius of the outer edge of the atmosphere around Kerbin. So this space in here between these curves, this is where the atmosphere is. This is the atmosphere. And so then I have another circle with a radius of 700, and that would represent an um, example orbit that we could uh, shoot for, and I will head for that as one of the examples later. I'll get to an altitude of 100 kilometers. And so we launch from some point on the surface, and as we get up out of the atmosphere, we need to be going horizontally to the surface uh, if we want to get into a circular orbit. And so we're looking for a velocity vector that is fast enough so that gravity provides the required centripetal acceleration to keep us in that circular orbit so that we don't speed up and don't slow down but just continue to orbit. 
So to orbit carbon, we need to launch vertically to clear the atmosphere, but also gain enough horizontal velocity so that while the force of gravity would cause us to turn back toward carbon, we are going fast enough horizontally that gravity exactly matches the centripetal, acceler centripetal acceleration for a particular orbital radius. When we're outside of the atmosphere and we stop the thrusters, then the only force acting on the rocket is gravity. If our velocity is perpendicular to that force of gravity, that is, we're traveling horizontally to the surface, then gravity doesn't speed us up or slow us down. It only causes us to turn. Then our velocity is changing only because we are turning. Our speed, which is the magnitude of our velocity, would stay constant. Gravity is keeping us orbiting the planet, neither gaining nor s losing speed. And that's a stable circular orbit. All right, might be theoretically possible to enter directly into a circular orbit from launch, but in practice, that's just impossible. So here in the simulation, we'll just launch vertically upward, and I'll eyeball it. You can keep an eye on the altitude at the top of the screen, starting at 83 meters right now, and the speed that's shown on the nav ball. I'm going to aim, right now I'm at 300 meters, I'm going to aim for about 100 kilometers, so 100,000 meters. With the ship eventually oriented parallel to the surface, and I need to get the speed up to around 2200 meters per second. So right now I'm at 200 meters per second. I'm going to speed up the film, or the video, so we can get to the uh, uh, out of the atmosphere quicker. You can also pay attention to the apoapsis and periapsis at the top left of the screen. And you'll see I'll start pretty soon to do some orbital maneuvers to circularize this. So right now you can see my trajectory in the apoapsis right there. It's currently still a parabolic trajectory because gravity is still going to pull us down because we're not going fast enough uh, to, to have gravity just only turn us. Plus because we're still in the atmosphere here at 35,000 meters, uh, there's still drag that's going to uh, cause us to slow down, and then we'll just head back down to the surface. So we need to get up outside of 70,000 meters. Right now I'm at 40,000, so I'm continuing to climb, but I'm still in the atmosphere. Continuing to go faster. Right now I'm at 16, 1,700 meters per second. Trying to get up over 2,000 meters per second outside of the atmosphere uh, beyond 70,000 meters. Once I get up beyond 70,000 meters, I can start making little orbital maneuvers. Okay, here's stage separation. So I'm looking at the apoapsis. That's well outside the atmosphere, but I didn't have enough horizontal velocity to continue uh, hor to stay in orbit. So I get enough horizontal velocity and to be oriented, so um, oriented parallel to the surface. That's about where I am now. So we're definitely in space, but as I get closer to that apoapsis, I'm going to fire the rockets again, which will raise up the periapsis, and then finally we'll hit, we'll be in a circular orbit. So there's firing the engines, and there's, a, there's an orbit that's nearly circular, and I'll start to continue to adjust it to get it closer and closer to a circular orbit. So here I'm continuing to adjust the orbit to get the velocity parallel to the surface and around 2200 meters per second. Okay, and so that's about where I was when we started the when I started the video here orbiting above the planet. in a circular orbit. So let's take a look at some of the mathematics of the circuit of a circular orbit. So with uniform circular motion we could begin with the equation of a circle in two-dimensional space. x squared plus y squared equals r squared now if I divide both sides by r squared, I get this equation, and rewriting it, I can uh, put it in this form. 
So what we can do is say cosine of theta is the x over r, and let's make sine theta the y over r, and that's really fundamentally what the definitions of sine and cosine are. They, are, they relate this angle theta to a point on a circle. So we can rewrite these equations where x is r cos theta and the y is r sine theta, and let's just define theta to be omega times t, and we'll call omega the angular speed. That would be measured in radians per second, and time, we'll just uh, use the variable t and measure time in seconds. So we'll define r with this little arrow on top to represent a position vector for the trajectory of the rocket around the planet. v will be the velocity vector. a is the acceleration vector. So what I'll do is I'll take the um, x component of the position and put it here as the x component of a vector, a position vector, and take the y component uh, and write it here in the second uh, position in this, uh, this position vector. I'll factor out the r and I'll call this the position vector for the rocket as it goes around in this circle. So if you take a derivative of this, you get the velocity, and the derivative, well, I'll factor, I'll, actually the constant just stays in front, and here I'm taking a derivative of cosine and I get minus sine with an extra omega from the chain rule. The derivative of sine, that's equal to cosine with an extra factor of omega by the chain rule. And if I factor out that omega factor, put it in front, now I have an expression for the velocity vector for the rocket. And actually this indicates the magnitude of the velocity, and the magnitude is this uh, factor out here in the front. This is called the, this is actually the linear speed of the rocket. It's how fast it's moving in meters per second, or kilometers per second, whatever units, or miles per hour, whatever unit you want to use. So we'll take one more derivative. So the factor that was in front here, this r omega, I'm going to leave that as a constant factor in the differentiation. Take another derivative of sine, I get cosine, but then a factor of w, or omega, from the chain rule, and then the derivative of cosine, that's equal to sine. Actually, derivative of cosine is minus sine, so I end up with another uh, a negative and a factor of omega from the chain rule. And this is the acceleration vector, and if I factor out omega, one more factor of omega, I get omega squared. So this is the acceleration vector for circular motion. For uniform circular motion, that would be a constant velocity um, given by this uh, r omega as the constant velocity. r is constant, omega is constant in this analysis. And this is the acceleration that would correspond to a uniform circular motion. Uniform meaning it's a constant speed and constant acceleration. So r and omega, these are constants uh, in this analysis. So the magnitude of the acceleration is given by r omega squared. Okay, so then once the rocket is out of uh, the atmosphere, there is no more force due to friction from the atmosphere. And once the rocket stops its thrusters, there's no more force from the thrust of the rocket, so that the only force present, present then is gravity. So this F represents the force due to gravity. The force due to gravity can be modeled or described by this big G, the gravitational constant, big M, the mass of the primary body, the uh, object that's being orbited, like the planet Kerbin in this, in this case, and the little m represents the mass of some uh, smaller mass that's orbiting that body, the primary body, so uh, this would be the mass of the rocket, the little m. r is the distance between those objects. So this is an expression that represents the force due to gravity, and this is the uh, how that force affects the acceleration, relates to the acceleration or the change in the velocity of that object. Uh, so this is the mass times the acceleration. Well, this equation, we can cancel the mass of the rocket. It doesn't really matter what the mass of the rocket is to uh, relate the force with the acceleration. So we end up with just g times big M over r squared is just r times omega squared. So the acceleration 
due to gravity on the rocket is equal to this value. So what I'll do here is I'll um, assume that the radius is not zero, otherwise this would have been undefined anyway. So divide both sides by r, and take a square root to solve for omega. Well, we could actually, because this is r cubed, we could say it's r times r squared and take out the r squared out of the square root and get a 1 over r times the square root of gm over r, and that would represent an expression for omega, the angular speed in a circular orbit with a radius of r. Now, remember I had derived previously that the linear speed of the rocket would in a circular orbit would be given by r times omega. So solving for omega here, I can say that omega would be v over r, these both being constants in a in uniform circular motion. So if I set omega equal to 1 over r square root gm over r, then I could cancel the r from both sides and I get an expression for the velocity at some arbitrary radius from the center of the orbit. So this is one of the results that I wanted to derive. This is a formula for the velocity. Uh, this g is a um, universal gravitational constant that's um, the same in the Kerbal system as it is in the, in the real world. Um, that's g is, is about uh, this 6.67, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. M is the mass of the primary object, carbon, the planet carbon. And then we could choose any radius, and this tells us the required velocity to maintain a circular orbit with that particular radius. You got to be careful when you do this. This is going to actually be the radius in meters from the center, from the center of the orbit. So that would be from the center of the planet carbon. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to add 600,000 to any altitude in order to actually get the radius of the orbit. At this point, I could, at this point, I could just jump ahead and figure out the velocities at those two different altitudes. This is velocity 1 here when the altitude is 100,000 meters. At 100 uh, kilometers, I have uh, a radius of 700,000 because I have 600,000 plus 100,000 uh, to establish the radius of the orbit at 700. Right? 600,000 plus 100,000, that's the radius of the orbit. And this g times m is such a routine uh, factor to use in these calculations that you could actually figure out what that is. It's about 3.53 times 10 to the 12 and then just use that. So the orbit that I was at at 100,000 meters at 100 kilometers is about 2246 meters per second regardless of what the mass is. That'll be the orbital velocity at that altitude. And if I raised the altitude to 150 kilometers altitude, that means that the radius of the orbit is 600,000 plus 150,000. That makes it 750,000 meters radius. And so the corresponding velocity of a circular orbit at that altitude is 2169 meters per second. Let's check that out in, uh, in the game, see if that's what happens. Okay, so here I have the uh, orbit set at about 150,000 meters, both for apoapsis and periapsis, so pretty close to circular, and uh, speed is at 2169 with this particular altitude. And then again, right uh, with the altitude at about 100,000 meters, apoapsis, periapsis, about 100,000 meters, got a orbital velocity, orbital speed about 2246 meters per second, just as the equations had predicted. Okay, so in the ways that I've uh, developed the formulas here, I've actually ended up doing this uh, question first. Determine the velocity of the rocket at circular orbits of 100 kilometers and 150 kilometers, and we now have the answer for that.
at 150 kilometers, the speed is 2169 meters per second. At 100 kilometers, the speed should be about 2246 meters per second. So let's go on to answer the rest. And to answer this question about how does this relate to the work done by gravity and the change in potential energy, we'll go back and compute the work done by gravity as the rocket maneuvers from circular orbits at 100 kilometers to 150. So let's go back now to this question. OK, so if we're going to set about answering that question number three, what's the work done by gravity as the rocket moves between those two orbits at radius 1 and radius 2, we'll write the force due to gravity uh, in this way. It's the gravitational constant times the larger mass times the smaller mass divided by the radius squared. I'll put the negative on there to indicate a direction for the force of gravity being opposite to the direction in which we measure values of r. So we'll say WG is the work done by gravity as the rocket moves from radius 1 to 2, where radius 2 is bigger than radius 1. So the work done by gravity is just the force continually added, summed up, through all of those different radiuses uh, from the smaller radius to the larger radius. It's really force times distance, but the force is changing through that distance. One of the really interesting things about this is it doesn't matter what path you take, and this is a consequence of the fact that this is we're operating inside what's called a conservative vector field. That's a topic for another uh, video, but it doesn't matter what path, and so we're just going to sum up the force from uh, radius 1 to radius 2, whatever path is used, this will be the total work done. So finding an antiderivative, what just happened right here is the g, m, and little m are all constants. And uh, you've got r to the minus 2. An antiderivative would be r to the minus 1 divided by minus 1. The negative just canceled right there. So this is the function that will plug in the two radiuses. And it'll look like this. Now, notice that because r2 is a larger value than r1, this fraction right here is smaller than that fraction. That makes this whole entire expression negative. So the work done by gravity is actually a negative. It's kind of, to me, suggests it's sort of like gravity is kind of losing. You know, gravity wanted the rocket to come back to the planet Kerbin, and it's kind of losing in the sense that uh, the rocket is moving away from the planet. So that makes sense to me in that, in that context, or that with that sort of understanding about the sign that gravity did negative work. Um, on that, uh, with that change in orbit. In fact, you could, there's a definition for what's called the potential, the gravitational potential energy as the negative of this g m little m over r. You can see how uh, this is, all these numbers, g and big M, little m, and r, these are all positive. So with a negative in front, this is definitely a negative number. And so a graph of something like this, the potential energy, as you increase the radius, you can see that the potential energy actually increases but remains a negative. So if I now want to actually plug in the numbers that were given, grav the gravitational constant was the 6.67. And here I have the mass of the planet Kerbin and the mass of the rocket at 3,000. So this is a reminder to me of how actually with different masses, you actually do have uh, different uh, values for the work done by gravity. That does depend on the mass, even though the speeds don't depend on the mass. The work done by gravity actually would change uh, depending on what value you use for the mass. Here is the radius 2, that was the radius of the planet plus the 150,000 meter uh, altitude. Uh, that gives me 750,000 for the radius and the uh, inner radius, smaller radius, was the mass of the planet plus the 100,000 uh, meter altitude, so that's 700,000. And of course, you can see 1 over 750,000 is actually smaller than 1 over 700,000. And this is where the negative is coming from. So typing these numbers in, we get approximately negative 1 billion joules, or Newton meters, as the work done by gravity. And it's negative because the work is done against gravity. And just as an aside, these uh, terms for the 
gravitational potential energy, if you took the gravitational potential energy, which includes that negative, and take the gravitational potential energy at the end, minus what it is at the beginning, then you get a positive value that is opposite to the work done by gravity. So the change in potential energy, approximately 1 billion joules, and now positive because this is an increase in potential energy. Okay, so here's the answer to number three. But, you know, I think that this idea of work, it seems kind of abstract and arbitrary, and what does it even really mean? And I think it's kind of nice to point out how this work done is exactly a change in potential energy. That's the significance of the work done. Actually, you could say that generally in physics, this work uh, that we calculate is change in energy. So now we have the answer for three, and we've got the velocities at each of those two orbits. So let's go back and answer the rest of this question, number four. How do, how do those velocities, actually, sorry, let me back up. It said, and calculate the change in kinetic energy. And then we can answer how this relates to the work done by gravity. So once we've got the two orbital speeds, let's calculate the change in the kinetic energy between those two orbits. So we'll finish off question number four now. So we'd already calculated the velocity at the higher altitude was actually slower and the lower altitude, it's actually faster. And really, it is the definition of kinetic energy that I'm using here to find the change in the kinetic energy. So with the definitions for kinetic energy, and for the moment, setting aside the fact that the mass would actually change. If the mass didn't change, here's the, here's the calculation that would follow from assuming the same mass at each orbit. What would be the change in kinetic energy if it were only a change in velocity that we were measuring? So velocity 2 and velocity 1. Actually, I know that velocity 2 is less, and so I know that there is a reduced kinetic energy as it moves out to this higher altitude and has a slower speed. So I'm going to factor out that m, assuming that it was the same in both terms, and factor out the 1 half. And because I have formulas for the velocity at these two different um, altitudes, I'll put in what those are in terms of the radius of the, of the orbit. Right? So just like I have here, V2 can be expressed in terms of these constants and the radius 2, and V1 in terms of these con same constants, radius 1. So just plug those in for the velocities, which are being squared. So that's it's a little bit of an error right there. That should have been like that. It's always something. Oh, that whole thing has got a square root. And anyway, it's being squared, and so I do get this. So what I see is 1 half times the mass of the rocket times these fractions that remind me of something similar to um, what we saw actually as the potential energy, right? So actually this expression now is one half of what we had already calculated as the work done by gravity. So that's kind of interesting. It's the, kinet the change in kinetic energy is actually half of the work done by gravity. The change in the kinetic energy is exactly half the work done by gravity? Why is that? And that means that the, the change in kinetic energy is half of the change in the potential energy for the rocket. Well, how could that be? Why did that happen? That's a curious thing, right? So I'm going to explore that a little bit further. So I'll just begin with the idea that kinetic energy is just by definition one half times the mass times the velocity squared. And there's a difference between the work done by gravity and the work done by the rocket. And that comes into play in explaining that um, one half that I saw um, come up before. See, work done is a change in energy, but a total change in energy. So I could say E1 might represent some initial energy of the rocket. Then there's the work done by the rocket as it fires its thrusters to change its orbit. And it end up with E2, some final energy for the rocket.
So you could say that the work done by the rocket is the difference in those two energies. Those two energies are now made up of kinetic and potential energy. So this is the final kinetic and potential energy minus the initial kinetic and potential energy. And if I rewrite those two terms, I can say, oh yeah, all right, so the work done by the rocket is the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. And here I have expressions for the kinetic energy with velocity 2 and with velocity 1 and potential energy at radius 2, potential energy at radius 1. And I know that these velocities were can be expressed in terms of the radiuses. And so I will substitute in velocity 2 written in terms of the radius, so it's the square root of this constant gm over r2, which gets squared uh, in the formula for kinetic energy minus, and here's um, the velocity 1 substituted in terms of radius 1, it gets squared. This is plus here, plus these terms that um, represent uh, the difference in the potential energy and these negative and negative here cancel to give me a plus. So squaring the square root gives me this expression, and squaring this square root gives me that expression. Here I just drop the parenthesis. And then I'll just put this little m back here in the numerator, this little m back here in the numerator, and see, oh yeah, these are actually half of the potential energy. In fact, it's generally true with a circular orbit that kinetic energy is half of the potential energy at a particular radius. So that's happening here also. This was actually a kinetic energy at radius 1. It is half of the potential energy at radius 1. These are the, this is the expression that represents the actual change in potential energy. This whole thing represents the work done by the rocket or the total change in energy uh, of the rocket. So I have this result that when I have a plus 1 half here, and a negative one coefficient here, I get a negative one half for the uh, factor in front of the potential energy at radius two. This is a minus one half. This is a positive coefficient one. So that simplifies to this term right here. When I factor out a one half, I have that the work done by the rocket is actually half of the potential energy. Okay, we have the work done by the rocket is half the change in potential energy. All right, this is a lot to try to keep track of. So we've got the work done by the rocket is half of the change in potential energy. The work done by gravity was actually the change in potential energy. How could that, how could we reconcile all of that? Well, let me proceed a little bit further with this work done by the rocket. Work done by the rocket is this expression. This is half of the change in potential energy. Let's distribute the one half. Remember that the kinetic energy at radius one, one half the mass times velocity one squared, and because it's a circular orbit, I can express the velocity in terms of the radius, and squaring that square root, I get this expression. That's actually a positive number that is opposite to the potential energy. This is the potential energy with an extra factor of one half. So kinetic energy is always half the potential energy with a change in sign. This is the kinetic energy at radius 2. It is half of the potential energy at radius 2, but positive. So this is the work done by the rocket. This is negative k2, right? Because this is k2 with a negative. So negative k2 plus k1. This is k1, so minus k2 plus k1. Let's factor out a negative and say, okay, the work done by the rocket is opposite that change in kinetic energy. Stated another way, it would look like that. So the work done by the rocket is the opposite in the change in kinetic energy. And the work done by gravity was the actual change in the potential energy, and so therefore it's half of the change in kinetic energy. Okay, maybe a good time for a summary. In changing from orbit with radius r1 to radius r2, the work done by gravity was equal to the negative of the change in potential energy of the rocket. We saw that here. The work done by gravity was equal to the negative of the change in potential energy of the rocket. We'll say the work done by the rocket was half the change in potential energy of the rocket. 
We saw that here. The work done by the rocket was half of the change in potential energy of the rocket. That's written here and led to this other conclusion that it's equivalent to saying the work done by the rocket is the change or the opposite of opposite sign or the negative of the change in the potential uh, the kinetic energy. Finally, the work done by the rocket was equal to the negative of the change in kinetic energy of the rocket. So, returning to question four, determine the velocity of the rocket at circular orbits of 100 kilometers and 150 kilometers. Calculate the change in kinetic energy between these orbits. How does this relate to the work done by gravity from question three? And the change in potential energy as the rocket moves between these orbits. Well, we calculated the two velocities and we calculate the change in kinetic energy. And it looks like the change in kinetic energy is one half of the work done by gravity. The change in kinetic energy is exactly half the work done by gravity. It's also the change in kinetic energy is half of the change in the potential energy for the rocket. The work done by the rocket was a combination of the total, the change in total energy. So the work done by the rocket is also the change in the energy of the rocket. It's made up of the change in the kinetic energy and the change in the potential energy. This is the change in the kinetic energy. It's actually a negative value. Remember R2 is bigger, so this fraction is smaller than that one. And this is a change in potential energy. but It's actually a positive value because Again, R2 is smaller, which makes this parenthesis a negative, and that negative together makes the change in potential energy positive. But since this is a coefficient of positive one half, this is a coefficient of negative one, but these are otherwise the same expression, it's just a different coefficient, we can combine it to a negative one half g times m times little m times this uh, quantity, which actually would be a positive value, which is the absolute value of the change in the kinetic energy of the rocket. So while the work done by the rocket is actually a positive, the change in kinetic energy is actually negative. But So we can connect the idea that it was the work done by the rocket that is contributing to the change in its kinetic energy. And it's a different thing to ask about the work done by gravity. The work done by gravity equates to a change in the potential energy of the rocket, but it's not exactly the same as the change in its kinetic energy. But because these are both circular orbits, it turned out to be exactly half. The, kinetic, the change in kinetic energy was exactly half that change in potential energy. Pretty amazing, but there it is. All right, let's finish this off. Go to this last question. Compute the escape velocity at an altitude of 150 kilometers above the surface of the planet Kerbin. Okay, so to go about finding escape velocity at uh, any particular uh, altitude, I'll first compute what would the work done by gravity be moving from some radius r1 to infinity, uh, infinitely far away from the uh, primary uh, mass, uh, in this case Kerbin. So, the work done is this continuous sum of the force added up over all of that distance. So this is the force due to gravity with the negative to indicate direction along the distance measured by r. And so this is an improper integral. So what I'll do is I'll just say to integrate from r1 to some arbitrary point a, I can compute this uh, integral and then I'll take a limit as a goes to infinity. So finding an antiderivative for this expression, the g, big M, little m are all constants. This is r to the minus 2, which you use power rule. You get r to the minus 1 divided by minus 1. So the negatives cancel. This is the antiderivative. I'll plug in the bounds a and r1. When I plug in the bounds, I get this expression, but this is still a limit as a goes to infinity. When a goes to infinity, this thing will go to 0, and you'll have negative 1 over r1 times this constant, which gives me this expression here. This is actually the potential energy at radius 1. So the work done by gravity to escape 
uh, for the for the uh, orbiting body to escape the um, mass that it's it's orbiting about, it would have to be that the work done by gravity would have to be exactly that potential energy at that at that point. Basically, you have to you can see on this graph of potential energy over different radiuses to escape the planet with mass big M, the work done by gravity would have to be all of the potential energy at that particular radius R1. All right, so we escape the planet's gravity when the work of, done by the rocket is opposite that work done by gravity. Work done by gravity is negative, so putting an extra negative here makes this positive, and the work done by the rocket is positive. The work done by the rocket is also the opposite of that change in the kinetic energy of the rocket, change in the kinetic energy is negative, so putting an extra negative makes this whole thing positive. This value is positive because V1 is a higher velocity when it's a smaller radius. So the opposite of the work done by gravity as derived above for escaping the planet's gravity is negative of this value that we just computed above back here. So the opposite of the work done by gravity is this positive value, so we want that work done by the rocket to be this positive value, and the work done by the rocket, positive, this value, has to be equal to this g m little m over r1. And when we're looking for the escape velocity, we're looking for that initial velocity at v1 that uh, will cause us to escape the gravity of the planet, and we're by escape velocity, we're sort of looking for the minimum velocity we would need to actually reach an infinite radius from the planet. So that means that the final velocity would be zero if we chose the minimum required escape velocity. So if we set v2 equal to zero in this equation, then we've got this quantity here equal to that quantity there with the v1 equal to some value that we're searching for that we'll call the escape velocity. Of course, the little m would cancel, doesn't matter um, what the mass of the rocket actually is, cancel the little m on both sides of the equation, and solve for this escape velocity, multiply both sides by 2, and we end up with the escape velocity is the square root of 2 times the gravitational constant times the mass of the primary, or the planet, divided by the radius that we're at initially when we want to uh, at which we want to uh, reach the escape velocity. And so that turns out uh, really interesting that you could factor out a square root of 2. So you have square root of 2 times the square root of this gm over r1, which means that the escape velocity is always just square root of 2 times whatever the orbital velocity is for that particular radius. So then, since the question originally in number 5 was, what's the escape velocity at an altitude of 150 kilometers? Well, the velocity at 150 kilometers was this 2169. So if we want to know the escape velocity there, we can just multiply square root of 2 times the 2169. So at an altitude of 150 kilometers, the escape velocity is the square root of 2 times 2169 meters per second, and it gives, gives us 3067 meters per second. Let's see if that actually works in the game. Okay, so we know that the orbital speed at an altitude of 150 kilometers is about 2169 meters per second, and we've just calculated that the escape velocity at that altitude is about 3067 meters per second, and so the difference between those, the delta V that we need, is about 898 meters per second additional velocity to escape uh, the sphere of influence of, the, of carbon. Actually, that's the delta V that would be required to go to an infinite distance from Kerbin, where there is no more um, gravitational influence. But in the game, actually, there's a certain radius beyond which the game just says it's, it's far enough and there's no more uh, gravitational uh, influence on a, on a rocket once you've passed that certain point. So let's compare. It may not be exactly 898 meters per second where we see that we've escaped uh, the gravity of, of Kerbin, so don't necessarily expect it to be exactly the same, but it hopefully will be close. Let's see what happens. So here I am at 
about 150,000 meters, so uh, circular orbit pretty close to 150 kilometers and a speed of about what I expect at that altitude. And I'm going to go through the process of creating an orbital maneuver to escape the influence of the planet. So it looks like right here at 883 meters per second delta V, I still have an orbital uh, elliptical orbit around the planet. But as I push that just a little higher, up to about 885, uh, I can see that the uh, trajectory will escape, escape the sphere of influence of the planet. Right there is the point at which we will escape the gravitational influence or the gravitational field of the, the uh, planet Kerbin. So yeah, uh, I expect it to be about 898. In the game it's about 885. Um, I guess the difference there is because at that point we are far enough away that in the game you're no longer under the influence of the gravity of the planet, but in reality you still would be. Um, it's just that it becomes so uh, minimal, the game just, uh, I guess it's practical to just say it no longer, um, in fact this is exactly what's happening. In this game um, it's uh, modeled on just two body uh, the physics, and so it would be really complicated for the game to include the gravity of the planet Kerbin and the Sun and all the other planets, and so it just does two bodies at a time, and so once you get to that distance, uh, you're no longer in the sphere of influence of Kerbin, and you're in the sphere of influence of perhaps a moon or the sun. So, yeah, just about what we expect mathematically is, is showing up here in the game, so that's kind of neat to see. Let's not do that, though, because if I escape the sphere of influence of Kerbin, I don't really have any plan as to where I would go from that. So, let's cancel that maneuver. So maybe before we end here, let's just have a little more fun playing around with this game. So let's look at how do you actually uh, change the circular orbit um, in the game and in real life. Changing from one circular orbit to another always requires two um, orbital maneuvers. So we're recognizing that at 100 kilometers, the orbital speed is about 22, uh, 2,246 meters per second at 150, it will have reduced down to 2169 meters per second. What we're going to do is maneuvering from 100 kilometers to 150 kilometers circular orbit requires a change in velocity of about 77 meters per second. It's actually going to be a, re a reduction of 77 meters per second in our speed. So what we're going to do is at any point in that circular orbit at 100 kilometers, we'll do a prograde. That means in the direction we're going, the direction of our velocity, we'll do a prograde burn of about half of the required total delta V, about 38 and a half meters per second. That will raise the apoapsis. So we're going fast. What will happen is that um, extra kinetic energy will move us away from the planet Kerbin, but we'll still be under the influence of the gravity uh, under the um, gravitational influence of the planet, which would slow us down and turn us back, and it'll create an elliptical orbit. So once we're out there at maximum distance, we'll do another prograde burn of the remaining 38.5 meters per second to raise the periapsis, the closest point, up to 150 kilometers. So I'll show you what that looks like. So here we are with a circular orbit at about 100 kilometers. We're going to add in a maneuver to add a delta V of about 38.5 meters per second. And that should raise the apoapsis up to about 150 kilometers. So we have the orbital speed right now that we would expect at uh, about a 100 uh, kilometer altitude. And we're just waiting on hitting that.
maneuver node so that we can do this little two-second uh, thruster uh, burn. Okay, well I stopped a little short there, so I'm going to end up putting a little more thrust to just raise that apoapsis just a little bit more. So a few sec, another second or so. Okay, so it looks like I got about 150 kilometer apoapsis. So now I'm waiting to get to the apoapsis to fire again prograde. I'm going to add a little maneuver in here to fire prograde at the apoapsis to raise the periapsis, another 38.5 meters per second approximately. Check how those periapsis and apoapsis are changing and they're not exactly 150 as, as I want so I'm going to move where this occurs and I'm right here realizing that I'm moving it in the wrong direction. This is not good, it's even worse, so I'm going to try to move the node back earlier, right before I pass it, and then set the rocket in the direction of that maneuver. It's coming up in a second here. It's only a quick burn, okay? So now I am just in the direction and hit the thrusters. Right there. Okay. And then Let's check what's the periapsis and apoapsis now. It's pretty close to 150, so that's the idea. That's how it works. All right, well, the last thing to do here is to get home. And so I'm back at an orbit of about 100 kilometers, and I'm going to try to set a maneuver here that uh, lowers the orbit into the into the atmosphere and returns us back to splashdown. So that's what I'll do here. This is creating an elliptical orbit where it, the periapsis is now in the planet. So we'll leave this circular orbit. And I can see now my projected trajectory is, is into the ocean. So this will be a retrograde burn. So now we're just waiting for that to get to that uh, maneuver node. Fire the engine's retrograde to slow us down, to return us into the atmosphere, and to return home. Okay, so I'm speeding up the video here so we can get through this faster. I'll just remember that I might want to um, get rid of that uh, last stage so that I have just the uh, command or the capsule there to, to re enter with. All right, so there we are entering the atmosphere, and I'm watching that uh, other part of the. the upper stage that I let go, it's worried about whether I might actually hit it.
Okay, that's pretty good. Looks like we made the re-entry into the atmosphere successfully without actually burning up or hitting <laughs> any other part of the rocket. Uh, we're doing pretty good. Slowed down a whole bunch. And uh, now we we'll just sort of wait till we're at a lower altitude so we can release the parachute. So maybe I'll speed up the rest of this. Thank you very much for watching.